can just leave that here. And I'm very much looking forward to this next part of the program. And maybe uh, most of you can guess it's the reason the head of education policy was put on this stage to moderate in the first place. It's the only sort of point of contact uh, with quantum technology that works the best for me in my, uh, my job. Um, now, it's clear that no matter how great technology and innovation are, the momentum is always dependent on it being put into practice. And that in turn is dependent on one very important factor, the existen uh, existence of a skilled labor force. Uh, the German government only recently released a statement a couple of days ago on the estimated demand for specialists in the field of quantum technologies, and it estimated that in, long in the medium to long term, we'll need around 15,000 experts for quantum technologies alone. Now, if you want to be at the forefront of this innovation, I can only assume that that number might even turn out to be higher in the future. Now, what a more dedicated education in the field of quantum technology can look like is what we want to discuss throughout the next 40 minutes. And I am very much looking forward to our discussion. And on that turn, I'd like to welcome my guests to the stage. You can join me up here. And then we'll introduce each of you. Big round of applause for our guests today. <laughs> Just take a seat. Find wherever you're, you're most comfortable. Get settled in. Wonderful. When it, because then I can see the timer. Maybe you can switch uh, seats and shoot that. Watch. <laughs> that works for you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So now let's introduce you guys. Uh, we'll start to my left with uh, Professor Dr. Helena Liva. She's the director of the Institute for Future Technologies at the Degendorf Institute for Technology. Um, you started your first digital startup at the age of 18, uh, I, I read. Uh, and uh, you, you still study computer science at the time and uh, then started your career at Intel in 2005 as an application engineer, and currently are the program manager leading Intel quantum computing and activities at, uh, for EMEA at Intel. And um, in autumn 2021, you founded the first high-performance computing and quantum technology master course at the Degendorf Institute. I have to make sure I read, read that correctly. Um, <laughs> with a really high demand of students, and we're very much looking forward to your perspective on the issue. Thank you for being here. Uh, and next, right next to you is Dr. Bjorn Potter. He's the head of product at IQM Quantum Computers. Um, you've uh, been there since, uh, in that position since 2021. And before you were chief technology officer at the ESG uh, Elektronik System und Logistik GmbH. Um, <laughs> and you have a PhD in theoretical physics, if that's correct. Yes. Great to have you. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Petra Wolf. She's the head of the division Quantum Technologies, Quantum Computing at the Federal Ministry, Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, you have a, you're a graduate uh, biologi biologist who specialized in biophysics, so the ne next physicist here on the panel. Um, <laughs> and you've been <laughs> at the Federal Ministry uh, since 2004, so already quite quite a long time, quite a lot of experience with federal programs, I assume, in the field. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, Dr. Barbara Wehrmann, she's the lead at Quantum Link at Deloitte. And uh, you help clients leverage the benefits and to understand the risks of quantum um, and uh, yeah, develop long-term implementation strategies. Uh, and you have a PhD in applied laser physics, so the next mm. physicist on this stage, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where I have to say I, it's really humbling for me to be on stage with uh, four PhDs in the first place and three of them also being in physics since I chose to stop doing physics in 10th grade. So I'm very much looking forward to not only learning about uh, quantum technologies today, but also have uh, four acclaimed researchers on the stage with me. Thank you for being here. Now, let's start into our discussion. I want to start with addressing the core of the issue we're sort of trying to tackle today, which is what does quantum education even look like? The title is The Quantum Classroom. So, um, Dr. Diebert, I want to start with you. What would you say are the biggest differences between a classic IT education and a specialized quantum education? Well, thank you very much. That's a very wonderful question. I think it uh, actually is a question that concerns pretty much everybody in this room and outside as well. Um, so I'm in the minority here. I'm a computer scientist, um, <laughs> which is good, by the way. So the thing is, uh, in classical computer science, you focus on a different set of problems that uh, what you do in uh, um, quantum computing, right? So there is a different math involved. There's a different hardware, software, a, a lot of products. And uh, the way of thinking for, let's say, a programmer, for the, uh, for the people who are using this um, upcoming technology. 
the, the application as such, which means we need to adapt the, uh, the, the education accordingly, which is tough, to be honest. You just mentioned um, I started the first uh, master's program in, uh, in Germany, actually, on HPC and quantum. And we'll talk about that later, what that actually means and why two of them. But the thing is, there is pretty much nothing in terms of um, classical textbooks for the field. So we have to start building it from scratch, which is tough and cool and wonderful, by the way, but this is different, and that this needs to be developed first. Thank you so much for that for that sort of initial insight. Uh, I just want to go with a follow up to you, Dr. Wolf. Is is that a perspective that you that you also agree on? That also just the general groundwork really has to be done first. So we come from the other side. Multidisciplinary would be the keyword I'd like to put onto the floor here, yep. because come I have, I have a quite a long academic past too. I feel. Having a good, when we talk about academics, I'd like to come to vocational training later. Yeah. But in, in the academics, having a good basic on physics, chemistry, computer science, and then on top have a specialization in quantum technologies. Because on the other hand, we need, which we just heard, uh, the use cases. And to my opinion, it is always important to have a good feeling how is biology working. Then to Learn, of course, how the computer science, how to program the stack of the quantum computing. So I'm not that uh, an expert, maybe <laughs> IQM is uh, the better asking there what we need here. But what I feel is multidisciplinary, bring together uh, experts and computer science who learned to program, to learn to develop algorithms, find them the same language. And of course, uh, setting up, that is the other point, uh, at the university's programs. We have about 10 masters and bachelor's programs now focusing on quantum, but it's broader than uh, just uh, developing algorithm. It's yeah, absolutely. I think multidisciplinary is also just a general uh, thing that needs to be integrated more into our educational system, not in the regard of not only in the regard of quantum, but also just just broader. generally to open uh, well open perspectives there. Um, Dr. Pata, um, having heard these two perspectives now, would you say that that's something that's also mirrored in the demand for skilled uh, workers? Uh, Dr. Warf used the nice analogy of speaking the same language. Is uh, do you experience in the demand that sometimes it's just it's not the same language that's being spoken and also training on the job or ad additional education is necessary to have the skilled specialists that you need? That is absolutely true. I can very much underline this multi-domain um, perspective. Um, uh, IKM is a full stack provider of quantum computers and uh, we heard a lot about uh, the qubits and we heard a lot about algorithms because this is uh, basically at the forefront of what the technology is about. But in order to make it uh, work, uh, we need a pretty integrated system, uh, which starts, of course, at the chip level. Um, but then it goes over the control electronics. Then we have the uh, operating system uh, and software stack, which is at that level. Then we go higher to go to the algorithm, uh, let's say, libraries that we have. And then you need to translate it into the domain-specific problems. Um, then uh, you also run into the classical engineering challenges. Uh, I've been working at Abbas before, uh, and uh, that is a system integrator, and IKM very much uh, sees these challenges of system integration, uh, which means that you need an architecture, uh, that you need to test these systems. Um, and we need specialists on all these levels. Uh, and it is, uh, we have to the, the cooling problem, which is a tri cryogenic problem, uh, which is, has to do with chemistry and with uh, like a lot of mechanical topics as well. Um, and uh, then we need to integrate this system into the classical IT infrastructure. You mentioned the HPC uh, centers, which seem to be the, the primary uh, customers at the moment. Uh, and uh, so we have a very broad field of uh, technologies that come together. Um, and uh, yes, we at IKM are desperately looking for the experts in all of these levels. And then, on top of the expertise that these uh, uh, people bring, that this talent brings into the company, we uh, need to train them, of course, on the job, onto our special uh, technologies. So that is the, that's the challenge. 
may I follow up on yeah, this? Actually, on both of you, um, you mentioned this interdisciplinary thing. But the more I talk to scientists, just imagine a, a physicist or, or um, astronomer. I don't care which field, right? Uh, usually a scientist would want to do his magic, his science. He doesn't care what system he's using. Mm. And the thing is, it should at some point become so easy that they should not have to. And we're not there yet, right? So right now we need basically somebody, and th this is where the language comes into, right? We need somebody who could guide the scientists, the biologists, the, I don't know, language, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, they don't have the, the, um, the ground, um, um, the, the, the foundation, the computer science foundation. And we are basically right now forcing them to understand computer science and understand on top of that quantum, which is a tad difficult. Right? So we need, they need help, and I think this is what we need to do. Actually, point to you, you, are, you have finished uh, um, physics in 10th grade. When did you stop doing uh, computer science? I never had computer science. Oh, see, <laughs> my, my, my point exactly. <laughs> for the problem. Exactly, and this is the point. We need to go and start earlier in the education process to get the foundation ground rule going, and then let them be whatever you know scientists want to be, specialized wherever they want to, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if we're gonna start talking about how we have to just start earlier with, uh, with computer science education in schools generally, we'll be here all day. <laughs> I, I love doing that, but we'll be here all day, but it's a very important point, I think, that you're, that you're making it. Dr. Verman, I wanna go to you next. Um, we also heard that sort of gaining practical experience, of course, is an um, important part. Also, maybe practical experience uh, when we're looking at computer science at an early age, sort of having having access to the technology, seeing and feeling and really experiencing them. Um, I would want to ask you what kind of infrastructure and tools are actually needed in, in your perspective to de develop um, practical, really industry-relevant field uh, skills in the fields that, that we've discussed. Great question. Before I answer that, I'd also throw different skills into the mix of things that people need to, <laughs> need to know. <laughs> because I missed out on that question. So, I mean, I work in consultancy, so for us it's also important that people have communication skills, presentation mm. skills, and all of that. And I, I know that sometimes that's on top of everything. So our poor specialists, they not only need to know computer science, physics, quantum on top, and whatever, um, but for me, they would also need you know, being able to, to present your results or the results of others in a way that not only the specialists understand it, but the other, so the managers of businesses or whoever who don't have this specialized um, skill set. So yeah, that's the language so point again, right? Yeah. Translating it into a language that everyone else understands. Yeah, as well. exactly. So, so they don't not only have to be specialists, but also all-rounders, and that's um, even harder to be. Um, so, so now, uh, what was the actual question? <laughs> the actual question was, uh, what kind of infrastructure and tools and your experience is necessary to also develop uh, industry-relevant practical skills now in the field of quantum technologies? Well, I mean, so currently we have all these different quantum, well, let's, let's narrow it down to quantum computing, I guess, um, because we are, we are uh, talk not talking about sensing and all of this. So mm -hmm. for, but just for quantum computing, you have all these different technologies that are emerging um, and our customers they come to us and they want to know so which one of these technologies that are emerging that all have the label quantum are relevant for me and should I look out for so ideally um, someone who works in a, in a position like I do would know all of these technologies being able um, to know which technologies can be used for what sorts of problems uh, being able to to make a, a roadmap in their head and, uh, well, predicting milestones, which is which is hard even for one technology, but then you need to do it for all the technologies and then map all this to the problems of the customer. So it's it's a lot. So yeah. So what is needed or what would be needed um, and what we are trying to do is give um, well trainings that are not as deep into each technology, but that are deep enough. Um, so that all these infrastructures are hopefully understood, and then, yeah, um, well, being being able to work with that, yeah. So, 
Sorry, that, that did, I, I didn't answer the question right. Uh, yeah, that, that, oh, that, that, that was answered my yeah. that okay. question. Yeah, that was great. Um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Murph, I want to go uh, back to you next. Now, we've sort of elaborated on the uh, yeah multidisciplinary skills and also very disciplinary specific skills that are necessary. Um, I want to ask you what uh, you are currently doing also at a federal level to, to ensure that our educational systems, both with regard to universities, also you address vocational training, uh, are maybe on the way to integrating a development of these skills into the curriculum. So let me start with the, que the point that the question we are discussing here for quantum is a problem in all technical disciplines. So what my colleagues uh, in the education department did, they had an action plan on STEM technologies, trying to get this topic and very broad into schools, trying to attract women to come to the technical disciplines, trying to get uh, talents from abroad. What we do in quantum, we have a very also a very broad uh, uh, number of uh, different activities and we really try to start at the very beginning. We have outreach activities going into schools, going to the public, so that quantum is not this, oh, what is it, what is it, it's something weird, something very mi miraculous, but getting this into, uh, into the public and therefore attracting very early young people, not giving up physics in 10th grade, but uh, maybe going into the education of physics. So this is a, our the broad start. We have a program on quantum education, which uh, has uh, looks together with industry, which elements at the academics uh, training are necessary. And I come to the limitations in a moment. We have uh, on a student level, uh, quantum academies, where we invite students from physics, informatics and I hope very soon on, on uh, engineering technologies for a week to learn about quantum technologies in science, in industry and what perspectives in their professional life are opening up there. We award very good master and bachelor thesis and we fund uh, uh, junior groups at universities which has for one side, the uh, advantage that we have this person who is uh, going into the academic life and is going, setting up uh, lectures and uh, exams in, in the technology, and also, of course, educating young students. And, and the whole, just to give a number, it's about 85 million we are putting on the table here. And then the junior groups are just open, I think, on Friday. There will be the next call. We have now 20 groups. Ten of them have tenure, so and they really have to set up uh, the, uh, the education processes. Yeah. And as I said at the beginning already, there are already about more than ten uh, bachelor's and uh, master's programs, but it's not enough, I think. And here we come to the limitation. As yeah. uh, we have the federal system in Germany... It was going to be my follow-up question, so perfect that you're yeah. answering it already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have the federal system in Germany. We can help with elements for education, but we can't set up uh, world total programs. Yeah. So we can, but then it's a long discussion with the lender to yeah. end up. I'm very familiar with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, still uh, discussing on the infrastructure um, program for, for schools in the long term, so very familiar with those issues. Um, Dr. Diebold, I want to take a quick uh, dive into your specifically your master's uh, program. And Dr. Weff said that there are about 10 uh, in, in Germany in total. Um, how does your program really address the industry and educational needs we discussed before? And how is it maybe also different from other, other things um, you've seen in the past or that have been tried in the past? So again, um, we probably will sit here all day <laughs> if I'm allowed to talk about my baby. Um, but the thing is, uh, coming from the industry, I have um, a bit embarrassed to say over 20 years of experience in this field. So I brought with me um, a, a complete list, a list of what's missing, right? And this was an advantage, so not from a standard uh, academic view on, you know, let's try another thing, but uh, with a view of, okay, what's missing? What do we need to fix? And this is a bit of a different approach. 
also what we've done is we opened it up internationally, right? So over the course of, we have now uh, already released one cohort, they are ready and the next is following shortly. And with the last launch we had uh, over 1,000 applications and we only took 20. Why? Because we're going for quality, not quantity. And what we are doing is specifically to address this need of, um, to create, let's say, a knowledge hub in those special people, right? So we receive applications and I admit uh, applicants with math, physics, and computer science background to my course to provide this different uh, kind of view on the topic. And what we're also doing is we include in pretty much every subject, well, probably except of math, uh, include uh, um, cooperation with industry on that, right? It, it, I, I don't care what topic it is, but in pretty much every topic, there's a possibility to see how this is actually applied and why you have to learn it, right? Not the same as school. If I taught you why you need physics and how beautiful it is, you probably would not left it, right? But this is the point. We need the young students when they're done and ready and I release them to you, uh, you know, for, for future uh, employment. They need to understand why they have learned it and are capable of application of such. Absolutely. I, I, you're probably right. <laughs> um, that might have been the case. Um, Dr. Petta, I, I want to ask you sort of uh, also from, from the industry perspective as well, um, how, how specifically you address the short of, uh, shortage of talent and education at IQM and like, like Dr. Liebert said, how you are trying to fix the problem. Um, so maybe to give a bit of uh, frame and perspective, uh, IQM has been... Uh, founded 2019, so it's there four years on the market now. Uh, we have roughly 300 employees, uh, but we have over 40 nations in our talent pool, uh, which already shows you that we have to reach out anywhere in the world to find talent. Uh, it's not so easy. Um, and of course, being confronted with that challenge, we were uh, thinking of how can we tackle this ourselves. And we have, uh, out of this demand for ourselves developed an uh, IKM Academy, uh, which we put online, which is now uh, in, in a format that can be done by pretty much anybody with basic uh, math skills. So that is focusing on basic um, education on quantum computing, but also on algorithms. We've also seen that uh, we need um, practical experience with the machines. Uh, and uh, we need to get people into the labs and uh, actually work with the machines, handle the machines. Uh, and that is true, as I mentioned before, on all levels. That is the uh, microelectronics, that is the cryogenic system, the chips. Uh, not to forget that we have a big uh, chip factory in the background that we're using. So there's a lot of production technologies on, uh, on, chi on the chips themselves that we need to, to do. Out of that experience, we um, also uh, developed the idea of creating a machine that we could probably um, push to the market, uh, which led us to the idea of having a, 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 a low-cost machine uh, that we can use for uh, education and probably as a starting point for small labs in various industries around the world. Uh, so we created uh, IQM Spark, which is a uh, low-cost uh, full-stack quantum computer that can be used for bachelor and master education, um, but you can, it's, it's open, uh, so you can start exchanging in, uh, different modules, uh, experimenting, and probably also developing interesting research out of that, so you can um, start developing PhD students or postdocs. Um, I just had my son doing an intern at IQM, and he used both these tools, and just being there using real hardware was very fascinating for him, and uh, just opening a cryostat and closing it again, seeing the internals, uh, this is really driving people. And uh, uh, So that's uh, what, what we did, uh, and um, uh, I think the broader we have, uh, the, the broader a talent base we have, the more the ecosystem itself develops. Uh, we have an, uh, a conference, which is a pure scientific conference uh, on superconducting, because of course we believe this is going to be the leading technology. Um, we had uh, this in August uh, at the Technical University of Munich with uh, over 200 participants from all around the world. 
Uh, it's, I think we are still in early stages, which this conference shows pretty nicely. Yeah. Uh, we we uh, think there is uh, interesting applications and on the edge of being realized. Uh, but there is a far, a long way to go still. And the broader the, uh, the base we have developed, the better it is. And uh, democratizing quantum computing education is, I think, very essential for that. And that's what we try to contribute to. Also very interesting to hear. Um, Dr. Weinmann, I want to ask you, having heard this elaboration and sort of this approach to training a quantum workforce, um, would you say your approach is similar? Are you making similar experiences with having to sort of also address a really an international audience and international talent? Uh, are you facing the same sort of challenges and perspectives? Yeah, I mean, so our business is completely different than IQM's, of course. But I mean, in terms of international uh, programs, yes, we do that as well. I mean, so we or I have to train consultants. So that's it's different than specialized people who need to see a clean room from the inside. Um, but it would uh, still be interesting to them. Huh? <laughs> it would still be interesting to Yeah, them. I mean, and, and by the way, I dropped out of physics at the 10th uh, grade, so. Hey. And now I have a doctor in physics, so. <laughs> I still have Never a too late. <laughs> but, um, so, but we, we, we train our existing consultants, uh, as I already mentioned, so we are giving them in-house training and, and teaching them quantum um, the way, so enough that they then can be our, our uh, well, salespersons into their domains and industries. Um, but that's internally for us. Um, when it comes to um, ed educational programs for the upcoming quantum workforce, we collaborate with other um, existing um, initiatives, So and this is international. So for example, um, the Romanian program so we now did courses with them uh, two years um, where we also showed that quantum um, isn't just being in a clean room and actually building a quantum computer, but there are, that there are other um, professions in the field, for example, consulting, that they can also consider. And, and uh, I mean, we were talking, yes, so spoiler alert, we might, <laughs> we might also <laughs> collaborate on this, um, even though this is not set in stone yet, but... Uh, uh, in regards to educating the upcoming workforce, um, we partner with existing programs. We don't do anything ourselves. That's, that was the perfect transition uh, for, for me to go into sort of the next field that I want to discuss uh, before uh, we were already almost uh, done here on, 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 uh, with our discussion. Um, looking at corporations, also between industry, educational system, and maybe also uh, the, the government initiatives. Um, Dr. Barf, um, do you feel like you're also currently getting enough support from the industry in the development of programs, also maybe in sort of um, having specialists um, support programs that you do in schools or is there areas where you're hoping for more support is there areas where the cooperation is already sort of perfect uh, perfect in all in all regards in our research uh, projects we have quite good cooperations in the edu education part it was still a kind of reluctant we had a had a call in 2021 and this was actually focused on industry there were some cooperation projects coming in, but not that many. We are now in the process of uh, developing a concept on uh, setting up workforce from the very beginning at school to the academic uh, part. And I would very much hope we get input from industry. We're going to approach our industrial partners we have in our projects and to learn what is the real need, what do we need to address. And then we have to find out what we can address as we discussed our limitations uh, a minute before. So um, and I'm, I think in the academic world, it's not that difficult. But what I'm really interested in, is there some need for vocational training? The cryotechnologist, is it okay if it's a cryotechnologist, a mechatronics uh, specialist, or do they need additional training elements in their way? And until now, I've got very reluctant answers when I ask this question, because this is one. This is one area where we really can go into the into the programs of education mm -hmm. in the vocational world. But we are Maybe discussing this with our industrial. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe one of you also has a perspective on on Dr. Wolf's question. I mean, it's kind of a question. Maybe one of you guys can answer. <laughs> I would love to actually. So what we are doing is more of a holistic approach uh, to, to education, right, from our end. Okay. So for my program, for example, I mentioned before, it's HPC, the classical world, right? 
which the students need to understand, and then as an extension, the quantum world, so they can apply and add it as we go along in this, on this journey. But um, what we'd like to do is involve industry and provide some specific insights, right? So from, um, to, to, well, to have it independent, firstly, right? So you're not only focused on one technology, sorry. <laughs> but um, for, for now, we just don't know which one will win the race, right? So we need to have this broad kind of um, uh, approach to, to, to offer, you know, um, an insight into what's going on generally, and then invite the industry partners to talk about specifics, what they are doing, which I think is impro um, extremely important in this field. If you see how fast, how extremely fast um, the business develops, right, and how quickly technologies emerge and drop and, and develop, and we need to stay up to date, and this is tough, right? So the list, and when you get from the industry, this is a list uh, the, the potential students need to accomplish. It's gonna look a bit different in a year's time. So from our end, we need to adapt the curriculum extremely fast. So what we need to go, what, we, what students need to learn is just to adapt very quickly, because when you go to the curricula, you can't uh, change them in like a half years or semesters, uh, change uh, uh, system, so what we, they need to learn is to adapt quickly and be out on, on the top of the Which also brings us back to the soft skills that Dr. Rahman emphasized, yeah. also is something that a specialist in any field uh, needs currently. But this is something I don't think we can, what we do is really to get elements for the curricula and so on. This is something that is a personal development on a very different scale, and which is, to my opinion, is not really relevant only for quantum, but also for biotechnology and so on and so on. Absolutely, yeah. Um, maybe uh, just looking also again at the at the industry perspective towards also maybe uh, cooperation uh, with uh, with government programs. Uh, Dr. Petter, how would you say maybe also from your perspective, uh, certain government initiatives or programs uh, can support uh, also you or in general uh, society in, in sort of the um, our journey toward uh, quantum technologies? My personal feeling is that uh, Germany in general is already pretty good on education. Uh, we as a scale-up have more the, <laughs> the problem of how to get financing for now really scaling up the industry. So from the educational side, we are, I think, in a pretty good situation. Um, in our workforce, we have, like, uh, the engineering team is around 180 people. Half of them have PhDs. So we have a very, very strong connection to the academic world. Um, and it is relatively easy to reach out to uh, former professors uh, of, our, uh, of our workforce and just set up individual training programs and uh, cooperate. Um, we have uh, delivered one of our systems to the Leibniz Rechenzentrum, um, and that is kind of a, a research hub. It's a, it's a starting point where um, industry research and uh, universities can, uh, can work together. Uh, and out of that, we develop a lot of um, insights, uh, also of how to uh, train talent and educate uh, the people. So I have the feeling it's on a good way. We have a, an, a large number of, of quantum hubs in Germany um, that is also supporting. Um, and of course, I agree that uh, it is early stages. We have to be probably coming from uh, more the, the use cases to see where does it all lead, that gives a framework and then work backwards into the different uh, single technologies. Um, from that perspective, I would say we're on a good track. Well, that's very optimistic. Dr. Raymond, do you agree? We are on a good track, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, from my perspective, yes. But again, like I have different needs than, than I guess. Of course, but also from, but from your the yeah, perspective. But so, so what for me is really nice is that the so programs where the industry can hop in um, to existing education um, programs from the universities, if this is sponsored by the government. Mm -hmm. um, so because for me, it's of course always easier to um, dedicate people and, and resources um, to support something like this if I don't have to pay on top of it. Of course, I mean, there are, of course, courses where they say, so the industry also has to do buy-in because this is the potential future workforce of the industry, which is, it's a valid point. But of course, um, I get, you know, I get the okay from our leadership board, of course, much easier if it's only donating uh, time and resources and not money on top. So if, if there's this this joint 
educational uh, program where I donate my use cases and my people, uh, the government donates the money, <laughs> 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 and the knowledge is coming from the university, that is that would be a perfect mix for me. Yeah, in a perfect world, I think that, that would always just work. <laughs> but I feel the spirit of <laughs> willingness of cooperation, at least on this stage here together today. Uh, for one final round before we close, um, I want to ask each of you really briefly if you could choose three instruments and only three, that's two, three instruments <laughs> and only three uh, to ensure that um, we're able to answer the increasing demand for experts in the field of quantum technologies. Which three instruments would you focus on? No pressure, huh? No, <laughs> just three. Okay. Just, just so, first one, I would love to reach all the young people who are not joining the computer science as per se, right? But look into it and s stay on top of it. There is, um, I mean, honestly, if you're being honest, there is no way we can close our eyes and, and you know, let it uh, go beside us. So we all have to, uh, um, to, to address this need for computer scientists as such. And then on top of that, work towards quantum in this extremely rapid change. So young people, one. Next one is standardization in industry. And we had that for a long, long time. And people with you know similar age and hair color to me know we had this like for, for different areas in, uh, in um, development, right? We had this for graphics. We had it for, for chips. We had it for uh, well, many things. We know that. And now time is coming to quantum as well. So we need to address that. Right, standardization, and then also um, with support from governments, just fostering this collaborations more between industry and academia. Right, this extremely fast developing world needs support to actually be able to grow. Um, online training courses, mm -hmm. hardware access, and uh, use case uh, training on use cases. Thank you for sticking to the brief instruction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to uh, repeat what has already been said, going uh, to young people, telling them quantum is not something weird. Quantum is something really exciting, and it really makes sense to go into quantum. Second, uh, networking between industry and academia to match needs and match uh, the offers academia can give. And second somehow to boost uh, science in the academia and setting up the research groups because it's like a, like a snowball. Uh, I would go with a collaboration between industry and academia. I take the online courses and, um, and the young people. <laughs> Perfect. We had now we had the perfect mix. You could just pick and choose from, from, from the other parts. Thank you for so much for your insights and that interesting discussion. I'm uh, sad that it's already over. I think we could have uh, touched on a lot more points also with regards to just generally boosting our our, uh, our education in STEM and computer science. Um, very very glad to have you and thank you so much. I say a big round of applause for for our panelists. <laughs> And uh, you can stay here while uh, we hand over uh, into the next round. I want to thank the audience for uh, yeah, being here, listening so intently, your active participation uh, in, in the last uh, presentations as well. And now we'll hand over to my colleague, Natalia, who will moderate the next sessions. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.